Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to achieve great things and enjoy the process along the way, then do we have the fully engaged show for you. Today I'll be talking with best-selling author Thomas M. Sterner, accomplished musician and composer, and the best-selling author of The Practicing Mind and his latest Fully Engaged. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, how to use the practicing mind to accomplish our goals with ease and a sense of calm awareness. That plus we'll talk about butterfly brains, Laura Decker and sailing, a GPS gone awry, music theory class madness, the power of practicing golf, the little book that could, and an overnight success in only 10 years flat, and why in the world you don't want the stagehand to let the pianist in early. (laughs) So welcome to the show, Thomas. Are you ready to shine? Yes, I am. Thank you. Woohoo! And thank (laughs) you so much for being on the show. So before we dive right into things, I've got to ask, if we go back in time, can you tell us about your early guitar practice experience? I started taking guitar when I was four years old. Uh, My father played guitar. We didn't have a piano. And so he started me on the guitar. And uh, of course, I really wanted to be a musician. And I, what I remember is, you know, sitting up in the attic, we had an upstairs that was, it was an attic that was converted into bedrooms and sitting up there in the summertime in the heat and you know, plucking away on the guitar, it hurt my fingers. Um, you know, I loved the sound of the guitar, but I didn't enjoy playing it. Uh, I wasn't very good at practicing back then because I really didn't understand the concept of practicing. And I was very young, so I had probably a short attention span. I played for about two years. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I looked at the music that I had, uh, the, the level of playing that I had gotten to, I was doing really quite well. But then the um, the guitar teacher that I had got ill, and as as I dropped out of that because he had to stop teaching, I just didn't go back to it. It was really uh, several years later, when I was nine years old, that I started playing the piano. That was the first time we had a piano. It's it's reminding me of and and I wish I had kept it up. The violin of which my grandfather was amazing at it and and played with the with an orchestra through his adult years, um, but I couldn't keep up that practice. And then later I came back to piano. It sounds like maybe the piano went a little better for you, but then you also dropped that. I did. I started the piano for, um, when I was nine, and I played for nine months, <laughs> and uh, I was terrible at practicing. I absolutely hated it. And uh, the other thing that was was interesting was I felt like I – I felt like I could play. I just hadn't figured out how yet. Mm-hmm. And all of the, the typical exercises that you have, the John Schwamm and all those types of things that I was learning didn't seem relevant to me at the time. And after I quit playing, oh, several years later, somebody was in the house and they, they were playing uh, some Beatles stuff and they were playing the chords. And I'd never – the, the concept of a chord had never been shown to me, and I was fascinated by that. So I asked them to show me how they constructed these chords, and that was like somebody flipping a switch. After that, I um, was able to hear stuff, hear mm-hmm. pop music, and just figure it out, you know, through chording. Uh, interestingly enough, many many years later, I ended up um, tuning the piano for the teacher that I'd had when I was nine years old. And, and I just couldn't wait. I knew she didn't know I played. And at the end, I um, by then I'd studied jazz improvisation and played professionally and everything. And I just started playing the piano and she was just absolutely stunned. She said, I would have never guessed you as a kid would be able to play like that. It's all from latching onto the chords. All from latching onto the chords. For me, that was the, um, the difference between kind of understanding the uh, how to hear what I heard and then convert it into what I could play. Mm-hmm. I couldn't see the relevancy of, of all of the this note, this finger plays this note, that finger plays that note, and everything was just two melody lines basically uh, in the first nine months. I, you're playing one melody line with the right hand and one melody line with the left, and um, it just didn't make any sense to me. It wasn't interesting, and again, I wasn't very good at practicing anything. I didn't. I was very attached to a point of I could hear this music in my head. I just wanted to play it, and why am I doing all this stuff now? I just want to get to the point where I can play the music. So, practicing was really a nuisance. I felt like I had to go through. So, speaking of attachment and practice, we're going to kind of segue that into college and studying Eastern philosophy because I, I think this kind of peppered everything for you moving forward. 
It absolutely did. When I was uh, – well, but you know, to backtrack just a little bit, by the Go time I was a senior in high school, I realized I was very aware that I had this um, behavioral tendency of picking goals and becoming very intensely interested in them and attacking them and uh, burning up that intensity fairly shortly and then mm -hmm. dropping them and then looking for another goal. And I realized that I had to change that. I absolutely had to change that. I was never going to be self-empowered. I was never going to be able to accomplish things I wanted because I realized that if I – if I could pick a goal myself and mm -hmm. I couldn't see it through, nobody was making me play the piano. If I could not follow through with that, then I felt like I really was um, not in control of where I was headed. So when I got into – at the University of Delaware, a very close friend of mine was taking a philosophy course and he handed me this Religions of the World book. Now, I had never been exposed to Eastern thought and I just ate that thing up. I, it's particularly the whole concept of Zen mind and being very present and absorbed in the process of what you were doing. And as I began reading that, I began to apply it to just my whole life, and it, it completely transformed my experience of picking goals and, and seeing them through. And later on, sports psychology came into that, and it was also another big asset. Was it that you had a different perspective on seeing it through, and this kind of jumps ahead, we'll, we'll kind of jump around a little bit, because now the, pra the goal didn't have to be the goal, but could be the practice itself. Absolutely. That was really it in a nutshell. I stopped um, I stopped clinging to the goal and I began just using the goal as a rudder uh, so that my energy was steered in a right direction. You know, to use sailing as a metaphor, you know, the, the wind moves the, the boat, you know, mm -hmm. but, and so the wind is the energy. But if you don't have a rudder on the, on the boat, then the boat just kind of meanders around and doesn't get anywhere. So, you know, you, for me, the goal became the rudder. But the joy was in the process of sailing to whatever the goal was. So perfect. So from there, you got back into piano as an adult. It sounded like it, it went well. The piano career started to take off. How did you decide to switch gears and become a concert piano technician? Not easy. And piano rebuilder? Not easy. Well, when I was uh, in college, my degree was in turf and horticulture. I was initially going to be working as like a um, superintendent on a golf course. Mm -hmm. uh, that was because when I was in high school, I really had no idea what I wanted to do after high school. And the guidance counselor said, well, what do you do during the summer? I said, well, I usually – work outside uh, people's yards and stuff. And he said, well, why don't you go into this? And I said, no, it sounds good to me. <laughs> and so I did that. I fulfilled all the degree requirements, but I was really concerned about the chemicals that they were talking about back then. They were uh, causing a lot of different kinds of cancers. And so I thought, I don't think this is where I want to head. At that point, I was very active on the piano. I was practicing all the time. I loved the instrument. And my father suggested to me, you know, because I was so mechanical and detail-oriented also, he said, why don't you go into piano technology? And that was when I made that move there. Now, just because my personality uh, tends to be uh, very detail-oriented, uh, mm -hmm. I've been certainly been accused of that, and also quite patient. The the piano. What happened was when I got into the piano work, I I very much accelerated in it. I became um, one of the top technicians in the area, and then uh, later I was uh, tested out and was very high in the country. So that brought me. Um, into the piano concert work uh, because you're basically sitting down with uh, pretty much during this, the uh, 80s and 90s and uh, to about 2005 when I got out of it, uh, I was working for pretty much anybody you could name, the best concert pianists in the world, the best rock bands in the world, jazz, country western. I met so many of them, uh, big bands. I was in their, the rock players' trailers sitting right next to them working on their keyboards. Uh, there was so many experiences that allowed me also to talk to them about their discipline and their art. But that was how I got into that because a lot of it was my personality. By the time I was 23, I had um, every accreditation that was available in the country. Mm -hmm. And most of the guys at that time were octogenaric. I mean there was no young people in it. So they were all retiring and just giving me their business. So I became very big. Then I really went into the piano rebuilding as a way of – I thought I could free myself up to write the practicing mind because during the day I was so busy having to be in this place at this time and this place at that time and back at the concert hall. I was working through four states. There was, I just was never still. And 
I thought, you know, if I could go into rebuilding, then what I could do is uh, in the shop, I wouldn't be traveling so much. On those days, I could spend several hours writing and then go into the shop. And if I had to work into the evening, at least it was on my schedule. Mm -hmm. So that was how I got into the piano rebuilding. So the business became a mix of door-to-door work, concert work, and remanufacturing work. And, of course, that turned into seven days a week. It was it really it was, you the whole the- idea of doing that was to free me up, um, it, so that I could write. And what it did was, as soon as I opened the rebuilding doors, I had almost three years of work booked. And so I was just I was working more than ever. And uh, that was why I eventually decided I just had to get out of it. You built a better mousetrap. That's right. So from there, before we really go into practice and thought awareness training and the works in your books, how did you get into golf and what was it like working on your swing? I got into golf in my late 20s um, and one of the things that pulled me into it was sports psychology. I was so fascinated by mental performance, you know, how we function at our highest level and as I started to read more and more about sports psychology and peak performance studies, I realized that they were that, that and Eastern thought were just two sides of the same coin. Mm-hmm. That one was just proving it through Eastern the Eastern method and the other was proving it through empirical Western studies. And but they were both saying the same thing, that when we are in the present moment, we are functioning at our highest level. And I've said it many times, we accomplish more in less time, with less effort. And our experience of accomplishing anything is one of contentment and inner peace. So golf really attracted me because there's a mystical quality of golf. Uh, a lot of people go out there and they, they, their concept of golf is people slashing away at the ball. And that is true uh, in many instances because particularly for men, they have played baseball when they were younger and they just have this idea of I'm going to kill this ball, which just doesn't work in golf. The ball um, – uh, it's not a reactionary sport like baseball where someone pitches the ball at you and your brain just has to produce a, uh, a reaction to that. In golf, the ball just sits there and just waits for you to swing at it. So there's all this, these things that can happen uh, in the mind that can foil that effort. So I found that whole thing so fascinating and I loved the fact that I could. Pre- it was an individual sport. All the sports I ever participated in like gymnastics, diving, they were all individual sports. It was always completely up to me. And I loved – the practicing because I got immersed in the process of learning the golf swing. I studied everything I could about it. I practiced every day. I do hundreds of swings and I just enjoyed the, the, the whole experience of learning the golf swing. And again, in a, at a very short time, my golf game was was quite good, and in fact, uh, when I got with one of the PGA pros, he asked me how long I was playing, and I said like two years, and he asked me what I, my scores were, and I said I told him, and I, he said, "There's just no way somebody in two years at your age, I was 30 at the time, could play that well." He said, "Let me see you hit some balls," and and I did, and he said, "Huh?" I take it back. He said, "You could." He said, "Who taught you to swing?" And I said, "Well." watching videos and reading and um, listening in on conversations with guys like you. The whole process to me I found very zen and in, when I would do that, I, I began to apply that to everything that I was doing in life. So that's a, that's a perfect segue then. You did something very interesting in this time period. If we go back just one question ago, which is you built a better mousetrap. You're, you're – Kind of, um, you have these ideas of practice, and and I can sense the enthusiasm, the passion for practice and teaching people about practice. Then you made a leap, and I wonder what was the goal in writing the practice mind and the practicing mind. Well, when I first had the idea for the practicing mind, um, I have always been so in love with music, the spirit of music. You know, you never run out of room to become better. And any time I've ever found myself struggling, I can always go back to my music, composing, listening to music, and it always turns me around. So I was very frustrated by going into people's houses all the time. I routinely saw people that were beginning practice uh, piano lessons and Mm -hmm. many of them adults you know they had the house they had the car and they wanted to get into something bigger than themselves and something that was individualized in themselves and so they would buy a big grand piano and then they would start playing and they all followed the same path you know six months later they weren't practicing they were making excuses and then there were kids that that wanted to play and they would start and then they would quit and I realized that all of this came from the fact that they approached practicing 
incorrectly, a very, a very strong attachment to the goal and thinking that they were going to get to this point where as a musician, they were going to feel, now I'm good, I can just be like this for the rest of my life. And so initially I thought, I can write a book showing how I turned all that around, mm -hmm. and I'm going to call it The Practicing Mind. But then as I began to write the book, I started realizing that this was – I was doing this in everything. It wasn't just the piano, and I thought this is information that really could benefit everybody in every area of their life. And so that was when I just – I stopped focusing it on people in music. I just started looking at it as basically a concept of how to approach your life. Thank you, and, and I hope my dad listens to this interview because he got himself all the electronic keyboard and stuff like that. He was a good piano player in his youth, but he can't get himself to practice now. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's go from there. You wrote The Practicing Mind. We're going to address some of the concepts from The Practicing Mind today, but why did you feel you still had more to share in Fully Engaged? Well, you know, to be very candid... I had no idea how successful the practicing mind was going to be. When I, in order to write the practicing mind, I sold everything I had. I jumped off a cliff. I sold the business. I sold tens of thousands of dollars of tooling. I sold the client base. I was totally committed. It had to work, writing the practicing mind. W were and, you scared? I got to ask. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, I, w I was – I guess I was anxious. I was scared isn't the right word because mm -hmm. everything in my life that I'd ever wanted to accomplish, I had accomplished. I didn't think this was going to be any different. Where I made my mistake was thinking how I didn't have enough information to know how long it was going to take or everything that was involved in it. But a lot of that was evolving because the internet was evolving and all and I had never published a book. So I was – there was a certain amount of anxiousness about um, – I had – my daughters were going to be in college in a couple of years, and I had a very, I was making very good money in the service business. It was very secure. I had all the business in the area. So this idea of walking away from that, yeah, I, I would say I was anxious about that. But um, the book, you know, when I first put it out, I, I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll write this book. We've got the internet. I have access to the world. I'll put a website up, and people will buy it, and I'll just sit back and watch the sales. And that didn't happen. I, I wrote the book. Uh, within four months, I had the book completely edited, printed, and I had the audio version done mm -hmm. because I recorded that in my studio. And I put it out there, but it never occurred to me that people wouldn't know who I was and they wouldn't know what the book was. And so initially, I was selling you know, two books a week, and that wasn't going to pay my mortgage. And I was trying all different things, promotional and whatever. And eventually, the book just started to take off, and that's the reason why I called it The Little Train That Thought It Could because it was that childhood story. It just kept going and going, and it ended up being uh, number one on, in stress management on Amazon several times. I was getting calls from presidents of universities to come talk to department heads and all this sort of stuff. That, that sort of thing began to happen, and then I was approached by um, – New World Library, uh, you know, to to do a second version of it, uh, and and the book just became worldwide in like all these different languages, and then I was getting contacted by people from all over the world. So I was really intimidated to write a second book mm -hmm. because I thought I could just hear the reviews, you know, uh, well it's not as good as the first book, and uh, because I always felt people were going to compare it to that. But then what happened was, over time, I found myself coaching one-on-one -on -one with people and working with groups of people and doing workshops and all. And I and all these people had read The Practicing Mind and they were – their one disappointment was they wanted more. They just wanted more on the subject. They were fascinated by it. It was, it was completely changing their lives and they just wanted to talk about it more. And they said, can you tell us anything more about this? And they were also asking questions that were all on similar content. So that was when I began to feel like – I think I can write a follow-up that would be – stand on its own but really could be looked at as the second uh, – another seven chapters to The Practicing Mind. They really are a match set. So that was when I thought I think I can write a book based on what I'm hearing back from people and answer those questions through stories. And that's when I decided to write Fully Engaged. Thank you. So from there, let's let's dive into someone fully engaged here. Let's let's talk about thought awareness training. And you describe your brain interestingly as a butterfly brain growing up. I had a butterfly brain for sure, which was part of my my problem. I was very creative, and my brain was always visiting all these ideas. I'd like to do that. I'd like to do that. And then when I would see this, as I said earlier, I would get very intense and yeah, I think I'm going to do this. And then the the butterfly would go over here, and then I would feel like. Well, 
I'm not really that interested in this anymore, and now I'm going to go over here. And that was because the process of achieving this, I wasn't in the process. I was attached to this point that I thought I was going to get to where I was going to feel like, yes, this is really great. And so my brain was running all over the place, and what saved me was the fact that I was attached to this this observer portion of me, which you know they call the real you, and mm-hmm. it was always watching this. It was it was watching me do this and do that and go here and go there, and it was noticing um, this tremendous passion I had to learn because that's really where it was coming from. I just wanted to try all these things, and I have tried so many things in my life, and that's why many times people say, "Is there anything you don't know how to do?" Well, that's because I just love to learn, so I'm always learning how to do a lot of things. But that was. You know what happened um, initially, and that's where the butterfly brain came from. So, from there, can you tell us about present moment functioning? And and this sounds, in a sense, like boy, you are working on your observer. I was working on my observer. I was working to become more biased towards the observer, to be more anchored in the observer. And you know, when you are in the present, you don't really have any concept of time. We all experience present moment functioning during our lives uh, on things that we become very intense with. The problem is in our culture is that we are um, we are encouraged to be in a state of distraction well, through all of the marketing media, through all of our technology. We are tapped into the marketing media all the time. You know, you go in to buy a sandwich, you know, in a, in a sub shop uh, and they've got televisions going and music going. And I thought to myself, you know, if you were to turn all this off and it was dead silence in here, all these people standing around would be very uncomfortable with that quiet. And so we're always being distracted. We need these distractions or we feel we need these distractions. Present moment functioning is learning to be completely absorbed in whatever the particular task is that you're doing. And being absorbed in the process and when you can learn to do that you find and we find this it's this has all been proven out this isn't me making it up is that that's when we we jump to our highest level of functioning that's when and as i said earlier that's when our experience of accomplishing our goals when we're more oriented towards achieving the goals and less in the moment we achieve it then what happens is um th- that whole process becomes a uh, becomes an experience of joy and we reach the goal faster it's really kind of a paradox and when we get attached to the moment we achieve the goal then what we've immediately done is acknowledge this distance between where we are and where that is and we can't be happy until we get there and so we are we are at war with the process mm-hmm. of achieving the goal so the achieving the goal just becomes this thing we feel like we have to endure until we get to this moment out here they're very different perspectives and it's amazing uh, your experience of accomplishing anything, how it shifts when you become uh, present moment functioning oriented. It, it's fascinating. We were talking, thank you for, for sharing on that. We were talking before before the show, we were talking a bit about sailing and a bit about you uh, having your pilot's license and flying. And I can't help but draw about a dozen analogies in that one answer alone to flying. Everything from you don't want all the distractions going on to if you're concentrating on your landing while you're taking off, you're in trouble. And that's a great, you know, that's a great way of looking at it. You know, everything um, in in flying, they have procedures for everything, and the purpose of them is to pull you into the present. In fact, when you go to land an airplane, they have what they call sterile cockpit, mm-hmm. and what that means is, if you have someone else in the airplane, they don't talk. They just allow the pilot to do everything that he has to do to be completely absorbed in the process of landing the airplane. Because if he gets distracted, you know, that's when the airplane is flying low and slow, and that's a recipe for problems. And so you want the pilot to be completely on his game and completely in the moment. So that's something that's practiced. And uh, But you're right. You know, they have these all of these procedures. Uh, you know, when you get to there to look at the airplane, you have a pre-flight pr- procedure. That's to make sure externally the airplane is ready to fly. When you get in the airplane, plane there's a procedure for getting yourself ready to start the engine after you start the engine there's a procedure to go through to make sure the engine is ready to fly all these things are designed to keep you in the present moment and uh, flying is very present a sailing on the other hand i think what is sailing is a very good metaphor Mm -hmm. uh, for what we're talking about here because if you look at sailing the reason that you you pick a destination 
just so you have some place to steer the boat. But that's just to give you a reason to get out and sail. I mean, that you know, sail people that sail love the joy of of working the boat, dealing with the tides, dealing with the winds that are changing, dealing with all the different conditions. They're very it's very present moment. It's like the only reason they pick the tiki bar, you know, twenty miles away is so they have a reason to be on the sailboat experiencing the process of sailing. So I think it's really a very good metaphor for being present moment and process oriented. I like it. Can you tell us then, can you take us from there and let's talk about the importance of the practice of meditation? Meditation, and I, I, I call it, um, for the purposes of developing what we're talking about here, thought awareness training, because you can't shift over into anything that we're talking about if you don't understand, and you don't, and this has to be a conscious awareness, that you are not your thoughts. You are the one that experiences your thoughts. That's the observer. Mm-hmm. Some of the thoughts you intend, in other words, you use the brain, you use the mind to do calculations, to make decisions, but most of the thoughts that your mind produces all day long, it produces on its own without your permission. And the problem for people is that they're not aware of that, so they spend their day in their thought. You know, the mind runs around here and it visits these, it can visit any situation within itself. It can be out in the future, it can be in the past, it can be experiencing anticipation and anxiety, it can be experiencing regret. Uh, about something that happened last week, it doesn't like to be in the present moment because it's too boring for you know um, for the for the mind. So it wants all these. It's a problem solving machine, and it wants all these problems to solve. And in sports psychology, they say you know if you don't give it a problem, it'll go look. It just goes into search mode, and it just goes looking for one. And we just go along for the ride. And every time the mind fires off a thought, there is always a corresponding emotion that happens microseconds after that. And when you're in your thoughts, you just experience these emotions as if you're you're there in the situation. It's extremely draining. It takes away uh, a large percentage of productivity. Uh, there's there really isn't anything good about it. And but you you participate in it because you're not aware that you're participating in it. And that's what thought awareness training does. It teaches you, and it only takes 10 to 15 minutes a day, but it teaches you to be to, – it teaches you two things. It, it teaches you – it's a skill and it's a tool. Mm-hmm. It's like reading. Um, if you look at reading, reading is a skill, but it's also a tool. Once you learn how to read, you can direct that – you can use that tool to direct the skill. You can read a book on cooking, on investment, on uh, religious practices, whatever you want. And thought awareness training is the same thing. It teaches you to be aware of what your mind is doing, but it also gives you the, um, the willpower strength to put the mind back on task and direct it wherever you want so that the, um, you're not the puppet of the mind, but you're more the master of its energy. I like it. Why do you say that people who are who say they're bad at meditation are actually quite good, if not great, at meditating? Yeah, I think that's so amusing to me because um, you know when you when you practice meditation, what you're doing is you're you're watching your um, your mind, mm-hmm. and this is the reason why I don't recommend guided meditations because what we're trying to do is we're trying to be quiet and observe the mind thinking. There's nothing wrong with guided meditations. They can be very powerful and very useful. But in the context of developing the practicing mind, being fully engaged, they're they're really um, counterproductive because someone is telling you do this, do that, do that, and that requires you to think because you have to process the information. That's exactly what we don't want to have happen. We want to just sit there and, and watch the mind and see what it's doing without our permission. And what you do is you watch the mind, and as the mind – takes off, which it will, you will be with it because you have been with it your whole life and you won't notice that you're with it. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be an an instant where you wake up and you realize that I'm with my mind and my mind is not following my breath or repeating my phrase and, uh, and then you pull the mind back. So what happens with people is they get stuck in this idea that if they don't have a quiet mind, that they're not good at, at meditation. And in reality, the juice is in waking up when the mind takes off and then you wake up because it's in that instant that you become aware. Your awareness grows in that instant. You become aware. Your mind has pulled you off. It's doing what it wants to do, not what you're telling it to do. And then the strength comes from pulling it back on the task. So when people say to me, I'm not very good at it because all I do is chase my mind. My response is, well, you couldn't be chasing your mind if you weren't noticing what your mind is doing, and that's really the goal. So if you're chasing your mind a lot, that means you're noticing it a lot, and that means that your your whole skill is moving upward 
and you also have to understand that um, you don't master it. It's uh, some days your mind is very agitated and very active, and other days your mind is relatively calm. It's I've said it's very much like exercising. You never get to a point in exercising in your life where you can say, "Well, I'm done exercising. <laughs> I've gotten as good as I can be, so I don't need to do it anymore in my life." That you know that it's necessary to keep your body fit and. Thought awareness training is necessary to keep you aware of what your mind is doing and able to control it. I, I like that. I became a, a, a pretty high-level cyclist as well as a very good runner, and I wouldn't say, well, I guess I don't need to go out and ride or run anymore to stay in shape. But I wonder if you can go, there's a, a perfect example, it kind of jumps ahead, but there was a time when you were caddying a woman golfer, and she was kind of falling apart out on the course, about uh, maybe about six holes in at this point, she had, she had kind of, the, the train had come off of the rail, so to speak, but that was actually, in a sense, just like you're saying with meditation, a perfect opportunity to practice. It was a perfect opportunity. The reason that she had hired me was to um, – she was one of the best golfers in the state, very talented high school player, beautiful golf swing. Um, athletically, uh, she was at the top of the heap. Mentally, she had a problem by her own admission. When she was playing well, her game was worked very well. But when she'd hit a few bad shots, uh, then she would start to – her confidence would wave a little bit, especially if things continued. And then she would become her own worst enemy. And she wanted to know how to turn that around. Mm -hmm. And so she contacted me. She had read The Practicing Mind and asked me if I would work with her. So normally in these – and we did. We talked and talked about this is what you can do, all these types of strategies for when, when the wheels come off. Usually – at that age, they're not allowed to have a caddy, but she played in a tournament where she was, and it was a qualifying tournament, and she had planned for this tournament for a year. If she placed in the tournament, she would be able to move up to another tournament and eventually get to play in a professional tournament as an amateur. But the first step was placing in this tournament. So she had all sorts of positive stuff, you know, a picture of the trophy that she looked at every day and all these sort of things. And when I got to the, um, the course to caddy for her, I could see that she was so attached to not hitting a bad shot that she had basically um, – she had taken away all of the athletic ability that she had built. Mm -hmm. she, was, uh, she was very attached to just don't hit a bad shot. And I could see it when she was on the range. And as we started down the course, she just hit one bad shot after another. And initially, I let her go because the whole point was for her to figure out how to deal with this situation. And I thought if I started telling her, you know, this is what you're doing, then that was going to increase the internal dialogue that was already going on in her head. And I thought, let me just see where she gets with this. And mm -hmm. By the fifth or sixth hole, you're right. She was um, – she completely shot herself out of the tournament. She would imploded. Nothing was working. So then I stepped in and I said, um, you know, why did you ask me to work with you? And she said, well – to help me learn to deal with a situation like this. And I said, so how do you do that? And she said, I honestly don't know. I've tried everything I can think of and nothing is working. And I said, I think you're missing the point. The point is you wanted to learn how to come back mm -hmm. when the you know your dreams were shot, the wheels were coming off, you were leaking oil, nothing was working. I said, well, in order for you to work at that, you have to be there. And I said, and that's where you're at right now. This is an opportunity for you to turn this around and see if you can beat yourself at this self-defeating attitude. I said, you know, if you want to play in the rain and you want to be good at it, it's got to be raining. That's the only way you can learn how to do that. And that's where we all have this opportunity. When we feel like we're struggling, that means that we're up against a threshold of something that we're, we're, we're learning how to process. And if we can look at it like that, then we can accept the fact that feeling uncomfortable is not abnormal, uh, that we aren't going to master it in one repetition. We're in a process of gathering data, and that's okay. That's a normal part of that process, and this is really an opportunity instead of a failure. And just that little bit with her gave her a different perspective, and within like two holes, she had her swing back and she was striping it. Now, she didn't, she didn't place in the tournament. But she told me afterwards that if she had a choice between what she learned about herself that day and, and all of the trophies she had won, she said, it's a no-brainer. She said, I, I really feel that I, a major shift happened within me today uh, because I've learned that even when it, everything feels like it's gone, I can turn it around. And she said, that was what I was trying to figure out how to do. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> that's how it felt. Believe me, uh, to to be there firsthand and watch the transformation was. Um, it, it was just an amazing experience. There, from from that golf game, something this again jumps ahead, but it seems like a perfect segue. So I I, I don't want to miss this opportunity. The power and importance and benefit of quote unquote mistakes, which you say have gotten a bad rap. Yes, yeah, so a mistake is you know even the word you know conjures up a negative feeling, but a mistake is just information gathering. You know, but when, when you're when you're working at something, whether it's a mistake in, in your life, you know, you started dating the wrong person. You know, I mean, well, what what happened there? Well, you learned more about yourself and what your needs are. It's not a bad thing. I think that that's the problem with the word. You know, we, we when we hear that word, I made a mistake. You know, that sounds like a failure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but all a mistake is, it's it's just a fact gathering um, system. And it works very well. I mean, that when we, as we're gathering data to find out what works and what doesn't work, this information comes into us. And we shouldn't be looking at stuff that we realize doesn't work and say that's a mistake. No, it's just data. That's all it is. We make the judgment to call it a mistake, and then we have these bad feelings about it. But in reality, it's, it, all it is is information. How do we convince those around us of that, or do we have to become – a lot of us go through lives and we make mistakes on our learning, on our path, but if we tell those we love, those who have supported us, they might go, why are you doing something so risky? Why are you, in a sense, screwing things up? You should do something where you're not going to make mistakes. Well, that's a completely different perspective on that – You know, to, to stay in a position – where you never make a mistake is to, to not evolve, mm-hmm. for one. And I think that what people need to realize is that um, we're designed – we would be living in caves if we did, weren't interested in taking risks. And it, uh, you know, If you look at all of the great artwork, all the great music, all the great technology inventions, all that have come – through, quote, mistakes. I mean, you know, things have been tried, things have been, uh, what works, what doesn't work, has all been part of that. So the the whole human spirit craves the challenge, and the challenge means it's a risk by nature. And it means that you're going to be up against things. You're in an area where you haven't done this stuff before. So you have to be gathering information when you're doing that. It's just part of the process. And so for me, it's all about perspective. I'm not... I'm not interested in just – and I don't think anybody – anybody that sits still for very long, they get they get bored because the human spirit is driven to look for challenges, to expand. That's what the human spirit wants. And so you know, people say, I'd like to just sit on the beach and um, you know, drink margaritas. Yeah, well, about a month of that and, and you've had enough. I mean that's really what happens is you start – people become bored. That's the purpose of boredom. You know, Boredom is there to say, you know what? It's time to get moving uh, and it's it, – when you feel bored, you go looking for stuff because you're bored. You know that's another word that we we misuse. You know I don't think boredom is a bad thing because it's like a trigger. You know to to make us feel like I got to find something to do because what I'm doing here I'm not evolving at. Discomfort and disease, disease, good guidance. From there, maybe we can talk real briefly about a music theory class gone bad and what perspective has to do with anything. Yes, when I was at the University of Delaware. Um, they were trying an experiment, and of course, this was back before we had the internet. Um, so they had set up these computers. They had um, the, the system was called Play-Doh. I'm sure that was an acronym for something. But there was a series of tests on the computer that you had to do in this music theory. It would it would throw questions out at you, like uh, type in the Mixolydian scale for the key of G, something like that, uh, and you would have to type it in on the computer and in order to go to the next level, you'd have to type in the right answer. So unknown to me in the class, I was um, a- actually when I took this class, I was in my mid-20s. I was out of college, and I'd gone back to take some advanced theory just for myself. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't stressed out because I didn't really care about a grade. I was just looking for information. But a lot of the kids that were in the class were very stressed out because this was over 30 percent of the grade. And what had happened was when the professors set it up, they didn't understand enough. They didn't have enough data um, to come up with what is a reasonable amount of time for someone to type this information and in, to physically type it in, even if they knew the answer. 
And uh, uh -oh. <laughs> so what happened was is the kids were just falling behind. And the professor came in one day and said, you know, I just want to remind you all that you're not keeping up with the syllabus. And if you if you don't, you're going to flunk that portion of your grade and that will, um, you know, you'll end up with a D no matter how well you do on everything else. Well, these kids were – they were wound tighter than a drum. I wasn't again because I didn't care about the grade. But I had I had figured out that I couldn't type the air answers in uh, fast enough. And that was because there was a timer. Every time the question came up, it was like a game show. There was a clock up there going tick, 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 tick. And so, you know, of course, you're constantly looking at that and it's making you nervous. And then one time, one evening, I went in there. It was The room was open 24 hours. Uh, there was a girl in there and she was in the she was in the sister class. There were two classes, and what we didn't know, nobody knew, it was a big secret, was that the one class didn't have a timer. They could take as long as they wanted to put the answer in. The other class had a timer because the professors were doing this study to see if they put a timer on, it would if it would force you to learn the information faster and you would get through the syllabus faster. So um, I had this clock on, and I happened to sit back in the chair, and I looked over, and she didn't have a clock. And I said, well, where's your clock? And she said, what clock? And I said, you know, the clock, this time again. She said, we don't have a clock. And I said, you mean you can take as long as you want to type, type the answer in? I said, yeah. And she said, no, we don't have one. And uh, so then she took me out of the hall, and she said, this is what's going on. There's this test going on. And she had uncovered it because she was, she was failing the class, mm -hmm. and her parents were upset with her because she had a scholarship. She was going to lose a scholarship. And so she was very stressed out and she had gone to the professors. And she said they had told her about this study that was going on, but she wasn't supposed to reveal it to anybody. So what happened was the um, because the other kids in the class that I was in that had the clocks didn't know this, they just began to cheat uh, because they thought, thought, well, I've done everything I can to get through this this um, study or and I'm not I just can't keep up with it so they just started writing all the answers down they just had everything they knew what all the questions but they just had them they just peel them off and just type them in so they were all getting A's but they weren't learning anything and so you know to me that's a perfect example of how we become so attached to the, to the goal and not the process the process of educating these people the process of the people being educated was completely thrown out the window. All that was important was the grade at the end. And so at, at the end, you couldn't blame the kids because all anybody was ever going to look at was that grade. Mm -hmm. If they learned all the scales but they got an F, people would think they were a failure and that they hadn't learned them. If they got an A, they would assume they had. So it was um, – it was really a very interesting observation for me. Again, I was very separate from it because I was, wasn't a college kid living on campus at that point in my life. I was just someone that was, was trying to learn more about theory. Thank you for sharing on that. And we're going we're gonna to kind of jump ahead to a really important question here, which is kind of a, 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 a key guiding principle to goals and this goal and then the next goal and then the next goal. The question, and then what? And then what is, you know, it's a mantra that I've used um, to pull myself back into the present. When I find that uh, I'm impatient, whenever you're impatient, it means that you are not in the present moment. It means that you're anticipating something happening that hasn't happened yet. And what I find, what I've found that works for me with that is when I notice that I'm impatient, and through thought awareness training, you will notice, you won't, instead of feeling impatient, you will notice you're having impatient thoughts. There's a very big difference there. And when I notice I'm having impatient thoughts, I start to ask myself, I look at the goal that I'm trying to accomplish, the task, whatever it is, and I ask myself, and then what? And what I mean by that is I put myself out into the future, mm -hmm. and then what? All right, now I've accomplished this goal. Am I never going to feel this way again? Is my life going to feel totally realized? Am I going to be perfectly happy for the rest of my life? And the answer is no. The answer is this is a cycle that we repeat over and over again in our life. We become attached to this point out here. Then where we are becomes our enemy. And then once we get to here and we have whatever it is what we're trying to acquire or we've accomplished whatever it is, because the human spirit always wants to expand, we immediately replace it with something else. And then cycle starts again. So it's really important to learn to use – when you have that feeling, that's a trigger 
to ask yourself, and then what? And then to visually put yourself into the future and go, how am I going to feel when this happens? Once this is done, this cycle is finished. Am I going to feel any different? And once you begin to realize that, then you see the, um, the total folly of it. And you begin to feel more comfortable being in the present moment. And then what? I'm oh, sorry. I couldn't resist. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you tell us real briefly about uh, what you learned from Laura Decker and what she learned in sailing around the world as a teenager? Yes, when Laura Decker uh, wanted to sail around the world, uh, she was a fascinating young person. Uh, when she was, I think, around 12, you know, she worked up and saved money for her own sailboat, and she sailed across a large body of water. I, I, I think it was the English Channel, but I'm not sure. I, I, I forget. But, um, of course, she got into some trouble for that. But by herself, she didn't tell anybody. She, didn't, I mean, she obviously was this adventurous spirit. And then she wanted to sail around the world by herself, and she didn't want to break any records. She, I think she wanted to be the youngest woman to do it, what, uh, and she has uh, a movie out on it called Maiden Voyage. And what she wanted to do was she wanted the experience of visiting all these places, and she was very upfront about that. She wasn't looking to break speed records. So – she uh, initially the courts would not let her do it because she wasn't old enough. They thought um, that, that it was putting her at risk, and her father backed her on this. Her mother and father were divorced, and he backed her and thought she needs to do it. She was an expert sailor. And this is when she was like 15 years old. Eventually, she won the case and she was able to go. And that's what the movie is about. It's about the whole process. As she started traveling around the world, one of the things that really hit her was, particularly in the South Pacific, she was pulling into these islands and she was meeting all these people that had, by our standards, absolutely nothing. They lived in huts. They had a, they always had the food for the day, but they had no material wealth at all. But they didn't have any perspective on that. They didn't, it wasn't important to them. They couldn't understand the need for it. You know, she, in fact, she said to some of them, you know, if you had a million dollars tomorrow, you know, what would you do with it? And they said, I can't write nothing. I, I don't need a million dollars. And so what she began, what, what was glaring at her was this world that she had come from where everybody was, they wanted the next the next car. They wanted a bigger house. They, all these material things and they were miserable and these people had nothing of that and they were totally content. And it really made an impression on her about um, how we've just gotten so far off the track in terms of what we feel is important and where happiness really lies. So thank you for sharing on that. Before we start to wrap things up, if you don't mind me asking, can you tell me what you learned from the process of your mother passing away? Well, you know, when my mom uh, died of cancer, it was a process, you know. She, I mean, it took some time, and she was relatively active up until the end. I learned a lot more than I could say in an interview, but with some of the high points were number one, she had gotten into a lot of the reading. I had gotten her into a lot of the reading that I do. We were very close friends, and she found that when she focused, you know, more on her spirituality, on her. Um, uh, how she processed life and how she processed her fear, being more the observer as she became more the observer. She said, you know, when you when you put your attention on that, she said, everything comes into perspective and life seems to flow. She said, the problem is that everything about our culture steals that away. It's constantly pulling you into the future, making you feel incomplete. You need this, you need to buy this, you need to buy that. Um, and she said, if you don't work at it, she said, you just immediately get pulled back into that current. And she said, then you start experiencing life that way. As far as her passing goes, you would think that, well, how could there be anything good in that? But my mother was, um, as I said in The Practicing Mind, she taught so many, so much with so few words. And she, her personality was such that she was always, whenever you talked to her, she had constant, total eye contact. Even when she was in a lot of pain, you were always very important to her. And it was an amazing gift that she had. In fact, after she passed away, we heard from people that were that she had babysat for when she was 12 years old, mm -hmm. and they hadn't seen her since then, but they read the obituary, and they called the family to say, your mother was um, the most amazing spirit I'd ever met. Now, this is, like I said, this is, my mother was in her early 60s, like 64. So, but the, she had made that kind of an impression on the people. But what I learned was that she taught us so much. 
with her dignity and the way that she went through the dying process because she was always aware um, she was always looking at how it was impacting other people as opposed to how it was impacting her and I learned about courage um, selflessness I mean so many things just by being around her during the final days what did you learn about love well, her love was truly um, for everyone else. I mean, you know, and, it, and it's – you can't really define – it's difficult to define how that feels, but, but it's an impact because, you know, it's a conscious experience. When you're watching someone like that, mm -hmm. you learn um, what it really is like to love other people. And I also learned that – by watching her and going through the experience, like we said earlier, you have to be there. And you know, so you know, what I learned was by being there and going through this with her, I'm able to be. I have much more compassion and empathy, and I'm also able to comfort people that are in that situation in ways that I could never do before, because of what I learned from. She gave me that experience. She gave me the opportunity to go through that experience. Uh, I certainly wouldn't have chosen it for her, right. but simply by the way that she went through it and, and had this dignity and also had uh, her attention on how is this impacting you, I'm okay, uh, I learned – she gave me that opportunity like playing in the rain. She gave me that opportunity to go through that with someone who was really very good at it, and it taught me um, – it really expanded my ability to love other people. Woohoo! Well, thank you to you for sharing that, and thank you to your mom for teaching you that. The, the last question I have before we jump into a brief wrap up based on this is one thing that I'm hearing in each question that I've asked you, I hear one commonality that comes through above and beyond being present in the moment, which is coming from a place of non judgment to yourself. Absolutely. You know, judgment, I think that people confuse analysis with judging you know analysis always happens a microsecond before judging judging is always compared you can't judge something for you have to ana analyze something first i don't even like to use the word evaluate because mm -hmm. evaluate to me has a tone of judging in it yeah. analysis is just looking at what is and then then the judging comes after that and then we begin to uh this is good, this is bad, this is happy, this is sad. And I think that what people need to realize is that when you're trying to accomplish anything, whether it's becoming better at dealing with uh, behavior in your kids, investing, the judgment of yourself mm -hmm. has no value. You know, um, all that it does is pull you out of the present moment and make you feel bad. The, um, it, and the analogy that I use, you know, that I use many times, is if you look at a basketball player shooting free, th free throws, you know, the person looks at the hoop, they shoot the shot, um, they look at the shot, the shot missed. If that person gets judges that and says, you know, I stink at this, this is terrible, we really need at that point, none of that is going to make him make the next shot. It only makes it actually. Um, becomes a problem because it lowers his athleticism because his mind is so occupied with all these thoughts that are not positive. So to me, I really work at that. And as a pilot, you know, that's the reason why you're taught procedures. I said, you know, if the engine quits, you have two choices. You can scream all the way to the crash site or you can analyze the situation and say, what procedure do I need to drop into? How do I best handle this? Which is what Captain Sully did landing on the Hudson. Mm -hmm. You know, it, you know that doesn't mean the panic isn't there sometimes. It doesn't mean that the pull towards judging isn't there. It's a skill. And through thought awareness, you start to realize, uh, oh, I'm judging. I'm having a judging thought. I need to direct my mind over here to stop judging. All this stuff is integrated. Uh, you know, it's, it's all, it all rolls together and um, it's interwoven with each other. All of these things are skills. Thought awareness gives you the separation to be able to observe how you're handling, how you're processing situations, and then these other things like learning to not judge, learning to be in the present moment, those then you begin to be able to direct yourself onto building those skills. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So a question my wife Jessica likes me to ask all of our guests before the end is, what would you tell parents to help their kids with being fully, engage, fully engaged? Well, I would teach them, you know, it, you it, 
it's difficult to teach somebody to be fully engaged if you don't know what it feels like. Mm -hmm. So the very first thing you have to do as a parent is work at it a little bit yourself. Then you can uh, relate it to your kids. Uh, for example, uh, with my kids, well, my daughters are older now; they're in their twenties. Uh, but I still have conversations with them, you know, where they'll they're catastrophizing something in their life, you know, and they'll call me and then and then and then and they're going on, and that's when that's the opportunity to make them aware that they're participating in their thoughts instead of being separate from them. And that's the, the opportunity to say, let's let's be back in the present moment. You're you're at worrying about something that's a week away that might happen, that probably won't. I mean, those are the things when, as you become more aware of when you're in the present moment, then you can help other people to become aware. And that's, I think, is the key. As a parent, you have to practice this yourself so that you know what it feels like mm -hmm. um, when you're in the present moment and you know what it feels like when you're not in the present moment. And then it's easier to recognize it with the kids. And because you have conscious knowing, you've actually experienced pulling yourself back in the present. You've had experience of understanding the value of it because you see how it changes how you, you feel and what your um, – your interpretation of situations becomes different when you're in the present moment than when you're in your thoughts. And as you experience that, then you're able to help your kids because you, you can actually consciously relate to what they're experiencing and then you can find the words to teach them the value of it and how to do it. That makes perfect sense. So a question I like to ask all the guests just before the end is, what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? <laughs> I would say without a doubt, the thing that has happened for me is what I do, the work that I do, working mm -hmm. with people individually, working with people uh, in groups, um, teaching, nothing beats alleviating struggle in other people. I mean, nothing. there is nothing that replaces that. And I have to say, I am blessed with so many emails and conversations with people that come up to me when I'm uh, at, at speaking someplace or working at a workshop, or but just the emails that come in. And these people have never met me, and yet they tell such personal stories. And there's there's so much love in their, um, their presentation. There's so much gratitude in how my work has changed their life. I just don't think you can beat that. For me, it's um, it's really what makes all of this worth it because it's a lot of work. It really is a lot of work doing this and a lot of times you have odd hours. Um, but that stuff, every now and then, yeah, I just have to, I sit back and I say, I cannot believe how many people I've impacted. This is so amazing. And that is a giant, woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> So where can people go to find out more and to find your beautiful book, Fully Engaged? They can go to tomsterner.com. It's just T-O-M-S-T-E-R-N-E-R.com. Uh, there is a separate site for The Practicing Mind, which is called thepracticingmind.com, and then I have created the Practicing Mind Institute. But all of those, there's conduits to them through tomsterner.com. And they can also email me at tom at tomsterner.com. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And if you're driving down the road and you don't didn't catch any of that, come on over to InspireNationShow.com and we'll get you on over to Tom as well. So any last words of wisdom you want to share with people today? I would say that, you know, the takeaway is that you have to practice thought awareness training. You have got to do that. Everything, as I said earlier, everything we've talked about here is only possible when you become an observer of your thoughts and you stop participating in them so much. That is the key to the prison door, and you're certainly worth 10 to 15 minutes a day. You know, it, it, it's you can certainly find that, and the difference it will make in your life is just absolutely amazing. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being on the show, Tom. This has been a true joy and a privilege, and I hope it gets everybody diving into practice, diving into a bit of meditation, and diving into that present moment. Thank you so much for having me. It was a, really a pleasure. Thank you. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get fully engaged, and dive into the practice, and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will say, you are one of the best interviewers I've had. You are very well prepared. Very well prepared. I couldn't believe some of the stuff you pulled up. <laughs> like, how did he get that information? <laughs> Like, you have really researched me. Thank you. It's, and that's the reason why you're one of the top shows. 
uh, because like I said, you're uh, you're very good at steering the interview and you're very knowledgeable on on the interviewee. So that's, I was very impressed. Thanks, it's uh, that means a lot. It's uh, a true labor of love and uh, it's, it's our woohoo of doing what we can for people. Well, you certainly are. And like I said, I realize like, you have put a lot of time into researching me. I mean, I really, and if you're doing this on a regular basis, Daily it's show. full-time work. It is full-time work. Um, and I give you a lot of credit because, you know, if you just look at books, you know, I, people ask me about, you know, what you get upset with bad reviews. No, I, as long as they're not insulting. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, like for me, if you don't like Chinese food, it doesn't matter how well it's prepared. And so, and I realize that you're not going to hand a book to everybody out there and they're going to think it's a great book. I mean, that's just, that's just the nature of the thing. And I feel like um, the, the way that that uh, applies to you is you have to read all this. You have to read these books. You have to research these people. And even though you may want their content, it may not be something that you really feel like reading about. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people realize what a commitment that takes you know, to do that. Because I've had people hand me books and say, hey, Tom, this is the greatest book I've read. And I can't get through chapter two. I mean, it's just like, I'm like, I'm just not interested in this book. It is well written, but I'm just not interested in it. And like I said, that for you is something you have to overcome with commitment because you're putting all this information out to the people. And so just because you may not be super passionate about it doesn't mean the people don't need to hear it. So uh, hats off to you for that. Thank you. you. You hit a nail on the head and we're always saying if, the, if we run into that um, where, where it doesn't quite fit with us, what can we do to bring something out of this? that's beneficial to the guest and incredibly helpful for the, the end user, the listener. Well, and you do, you know, I, I'm sure you do. Uh, like I said, I was really, just some of the stuff you were saying about me, I was like, man, where did he find that? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you're definitely a good study, very good. Thank you, it's my practice. It's interesting when you said, um, about when we were talking about flying earlier and you said about three to four hundred hours somewhere in there is at that point or maybe 350 to 400 a point of complacency yes. and and we're in somewhere between 400 450 interviews in and uh, which I guess is more than 400 or 450 hours there's definitely no sense of complacency but there is there's always plateaus that you reach and then you want to it's not that you're not wanting to be here now but you might feel a stuckness, and out of that, big gains are coming. You just have to keep doing the practice. Well, you know, it's if you've ever read George Leonard's book, Mastery, um, he talks about how our culture is anti-mastery. You know, that mastery is reaching plateaus. And mm -hmm. then, and what happens is when you're on a plateau, but you're practicing, there's all the stuff that's going on in the background that you're not aware of. You are moving upward, but you don't notice it until you jump to the next plateau. So, um, and that's really what you're describing. Uh, you know, you are getting bigger. Uh, I would have to say that each interview you do, you must be learning something. Oh, um, heck yeah. You know, and so, I mean, you know, because you're just getting this knowledge from all these people constantly going into your head. and. Uh, that in itself is pretty cool, but like I said, it it's a big commitment. It really is a big commitment on your part. I can I can see that. I mean, when I have my talk show for a year, that was the reason why I couldn't continue it because producing the show every week, I was finding the guests, uh, I was researching them, and then I was interviewing them, and then I was producing the show. I mean, I because I was in the recording studio. I mean, I did all the music and uh, mm -hmm. and I did micro editing on the, the you know the uh, all, all the uh, voiceover work and. Uh, as my as I got bigger, you know, as an author speaker, I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, but I have I do have a comprehension on what's involved in putting one of these things on, and it's a lot of work. It, it really is a lot of work. And what you're doing, like I said, as well prepared as you are, it's it's really um, it's a tremendous accomplishment. I have to say. Thank you. There's a there's a hump we're working to get over right now to make this a a fully sustainable, viable, long term thing, where we have that assistance on board because of the workload, because of the commitment. So your your words are coming at just the right <laughs> time. So I, I cannot say thank you enough. Well, you should feel good. I mean, you are really you're impacting, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, and. You know, I just said that to my father the, uh, the other night. I was talking to him on the phone, uh, and I said, you know, 
uh, we were just talking about people that, that I knew that had gone into doing corporate work and were maybe making a bunch of money or whatever. And I said, you know, I said, every now and then I under, I realize how many people's lives I've impacted. I said, it's, it's really overwhelming. Um, and, you know, you're doing the same thing. And I think that that's every now and then you need to step back and realize that because the problem with what we're doing is it's you can get um, so uh, absorbed, which is not bad, but I'm so absorbed in the process of, of running the business and getting the guests and, and doing all the research that you forget what the out, the outcome of all that is. And mm-hmm. every now and then you need to step back and, and realize um, you're impacting people's lives in ways you don't even know because you're having all these people on. And I know, you know, I've heard interviews on radio, on the radio or whatever, and they have had a total impact, impact um, energy on me. But the person that's doing the show doesn't know that because I'm not calling into the show. Mm-hmm. So you really have no idea the impact you're having on people's uh, lives. I mean, you have some things where the people interact with you. Maybe they re- do reviews or they like stuff. But the, the um, you're, you're impacting so many people in ways that you can't comprehend. And I think every now and then you need to remind yourself of that. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>